These photographs were taken by a Sergeant Christopher Pilkington, who served with the 2nd Battalion of the Scots Guards. They show his unit crossing from Southampton on the troop ship Lake Michigan in October 1914 and their arrival in Ypres in Flanders, the one section of Belgium still free of German occupation. Today, Ypres looks like any old European city, but these aren't old buildings. They were all painstakingly reconstructed after the war. In 1918, Ypres looked like this. In 1914, Pilkington arrived here, ignorant of the horrors ahead. His battalion marched to the front line at Gaelefeld, four miles east of Ypres. Already a system of trenches had been constructed, designed to hold back the German advance. In Sanctuary Wood, one mile west of Gaelefeld, a section of those trenches has been preserved as a memorial. Here, for four long years, British troops dug in, any advance made almost impossible because of barbed wire and the enemy's machine guns. Shell fire, meant to wear down the enemy's resistance, turned the battle zones to mud. It was hard to know what was worse, a push forwards with all the terrible loss of life that that entailed, or the weeks of waiting between such bursts of activity, weeks marked with boredom, with anxiety, with extreme discomfort, and always the lurking fear of sudden death by a sniper or shell fire. Pilkington wrote a diary of his time on the Ypres salient. It hints at the horrors of daily life on the Western Front. Friday, November the 6th. And I tell you, I never want to spend such another night. About midnight, the most hellish bombardment commenced. For a long time, shells were coming along at about one a minute. We could feel them bursting all around us. The guns evidently searching us. It's simply terrible how the battalion has been cut up. In just three weeks, the officers stand thus. Colonel Bolton captured. Major Fraser killed. Lord Gordon Lennox wounded. Captain Rivers Baldry killed. Captain Kinnard killed. And Captain Fox variously reported wounded or dead. These are newspapers from the time. The Sphere, the Mirror, the Sketch, or today we'd call the tabloid press. I'm looking at a cross-section of papers from the war years to get a fix on how they covered the war, how they presented the war to people back home. There was no TV, no radio, soldiers' letters home were censored. If you had a son or brother or husband fighting at the front, a halfpenny newspaper was one of the only ways to find out what was going on. But the question is, how much did these newspapers choose to reveal? How much were they allowed to reveal? It's been said, the first casualty of war is truth. The British Army needed recruits. The government was loath to force people to serve, but to keep the recruits coming, it was vital people back home saw the war in a positive light. That meant controlling the flow of information. At first, the government just banned press from anywhere near the front line, forcing newspaper editors to send their correspondence to France and Belgium undercover. The Telegraph complained that, under these circumstances, there would not be any full and independent account of any action fought in this war. And so, from 1916, the War Office allowed half a dozen correspondents at a time on the Western Front, but only under close supervision. In July 1916, the British High Command was preparing for the greatest push so far, an attack on the German lines near the River Somme. The plan was to soften the German defences with shell fire, then send half a million men forward to take the enemy's trenches. The cavalry would then ride through the gap. On the morning of the 1st of July, the press correspondents were taken, like generals of old, to a vantage point overlooking one stretch of the 20-mile front. They saw nothing of what happened on the ground. 
and so they simply wrote what they were told. How on that first day, the men had swept forward cheering, encountering no great resistance. But the reality, as survivors recalled later, was quite different. We formed into one line and walked slowly forward. We'd only gone a few yards when my mate Billy Booth was hit. Then the man on my left fell against me. Lines of men were just disappearing. The Germans' machine guns fired at us like it was target practice. The wire was 60 yards away, but only a few made it as far as that. They became fastened onto the barbs, and machine guns tore their bodies to shreds. It was all over in 10 minutes. It, it was slaughter. On that first day, 20,000 British soldiers died and 40,000 more were wounded. The worst daily casualty figures for any army anywhere in the history of modern warfare. You look through these newspapers and the one thing you don't see is the horror. You see heroism, you see determination, you see plenty of good humour. Like this picture of men going up the line, you can almost hear them singing. If you do see any action, which is rare, it's presented as some kind of adventure. Like this daring raid on the enemy lines. This is a great photograph. It was taken later in the war when they were allowing photographers better access. And here they are, a bit later on, the heroes returning from the raid, backlit against the twilight. It's such stirring stuff you hardly notice the headline at the top. Big counter-attacks made by the Germans. Obviously, for an official press photographer working at the front, the fact their work was censored is incredibly important. Somewhere, just behind the lines, there was an official from the war office, checking every picture they took rejecting any that failed to show the war in the right light. So obviously, what any keen press photographer did was take the right kind of picture, capturing not the horror of the trenches, but the camaraderie, the men pulling together in difficult circumstances. You capture that plucky British resolve, you get yourself two pages in the Daily Mirror. Now, imagine the opposite scenario. You're walking through some trench, and suddenly you come across the full horror of this brutal world. Maybe a shell-shocked soldier. Maybe a decomposing corpse uncovered by shell fire. What do you do? Do you get your camera out, take a picture, record this historical truth? Sure you can, but no one will print it. It's just a waste of a good exposure. And so, Back home, people were kept at a remove from the reality of trench life. Some soldiers expressed anger to see the war described, as one put it, like a game of football. Others preferred it that way. Home on leave, they too refused to speak of life at the front. They sheltered their loved ones from that harsh reality. It was as if the press photographers, the journalists, the censors, even the soldiers themselves were all involved in a kind of dance, skirting around the terrible truth. But the truth couldn't be avoided forever. As the death toll rose, the scale of the sacrifice became apparent to everyone. This is the front page of the Daily Sketch from September 1915. It shows photographs found scattered on the battlefields. The soldiers who dropped them now missing in action. Many of these photographs have been taken in a scheme sponsored by camera manufacturers. As a patriotic gesture, they'd recruited amateur photographers to take snapshots for the front. Free of charge, you could apply to have your photo taken, to be sent to your husband, your boyfriend, your son, to boost his spirits. Now, 
Those same wives, girlfriends, mothers, learn to the death of their loved ones by seeing their own faces staring out from the pages of the newspaper. <laughs>